Okay, so uh, the red kite, uh, Britain's most successful raptor. Uh, I'll try and answer that question, or at least give you my um, my take on that question by the by the end of the talk. Um, first off, just a quick thank you uh, to to Dan Powell uh, for the artwork that I'm I'm using throughout, uh, which is taken from our, our our joint book that we did together, the Red Kites Year. Okay, so I'll start with a quick history about of the bird in in Britain. Uh, we know it was a very common and widespread bird. It occurred in both urban and rural areas. And we've got evidence from a, a variety of different sources. Uh, there's the old names uh, that were used for this bird, uh, putter, gleed, various others. And they find their way into place names. Um, they're scattered throughout the country, but you know, the red kite turns up in the names of, sort of towns and towns and villages. We've got first-hand accounts uh, from observers that actually watched the birds you know, even hundreds of years ago uh, and wrote down what they saw, including, for example, in sort of medieval London, uh, there's accounts of, sort of flocks of kites scavenging on the streets. And then there's bounty payments. Um, you know, this was a bird that was so common that people were actually paid uh, to encourage them uh, to kill it. So we know it was a, a common and widespread bird. Uh, we'll probably never know for sure, but I think there's a really good chance. I think it's a safe bet that it was once our most abundant bird of prey yeah, in Britain. Um, but sadly, you know, we went from this um, common widespread bird uh, scavenging uh, close to our sort of settlements, taking advantage of our scraps and and handouts uh, to this. Uh, and, and the map here is taken from Simon Holloway's excellent book, The Historical Atlas, and all the E's there are E for extinction. Uh, by the end of the 1800s, it had gone completely from England, uh, it had gone completely from Scotland, and it clung on in, in central Wales, remote parts of central Wales, where it did get down to just a handful of breeding birds uh in the in the 1930s and 40s so it came very close to complete extinction and really this was because primarily of human persecution along with a lot of other predatory mammals and, and raptors it was seen as a threat to livestock and especially to game birds uh, and it was it was persecuted relentlessly uh, so where are we today then um so we've got the reintroduction project uh, kites have been brought back to England and to Scotland by taking young birds from the nest in parts of Europe where they're still common, bringing them back to, to the release pens. Uh, and these two are, are in pens in Rockingham Forest uh, in Northamptonshire, uh, and then releasing them into the wild. You probably can't read the detail on this, but really the, the map is just to give you an idea of the different release sites. So I think there's nine release sites in total. Started back in 1989 in the Chilterns and the Black Isle. And since then, there have been these various, various different projects. The last one, I think, was Cumbria, which finished, I think, in 2012. And at each of these sites, between roughly 70 uh, and 100 birds would be released into the wild uh, to get populations established. So this is a little bit dated, but it gives you a pretty good idea uh, of the distribution. Uh, and a few things to note here. Uh, you can see that the Welsh population, the, the, the native uh, Welsh population is now spread out uh, into, into Western England. Uh, you can see the population is doing really, really well in the south, the southern England, the Chilterns birds, and also the Midlands. And those, those populations have now, have now merged together. Um, and then you've got the smaller populations dotted around, centred on the release sites uh, in, further north in England and Scotland. Um, but it's still patchy. Uh, there's still large parts of the country, even now, where it's just a rare visitor. Maybe there's the odd pair that breeds, but it's still very, very scarce, and you don't see too many kites. So 
although it's been doing really well, it still has got a long way to go in terms of spreading back throughout uh, throughout Britain. This is a real guesstimate, I'm afraid. Uh, we have lost track of the numbers uh, of birds, various estimates knocking around. Uh, I did uh, I put an estimate together for the for the red kites year a few years ago, which I think was five to six thousand. It really is guessing, but I mean seven or eight thousand is not unrealistic, and the vast majority of those will be in the southern half of the country with the Welsh birds and then uh, the birds in central uh, and southern England. So it's doing really well, uh, and when let's have a look at why that is. Uh, and I think the first thing to say is that it's just a really flexible, adaptable bird. Uh, it'll eat almost anything from earthworms and beetles, you know, really right at the small end, up to scavenging on livestock carcasses when it gets the chance, so the really big stuff as well. It'll take advantage of, of human activities, so you get birds following uh, agricultural operations, you get them scavenging on landfill sites. They're quite happy scavenging on, on, on carcasses. Uh, they'll snatch up bits of food from, from the ground so they can take advantage of road kills. So yeah, uh, it's, it's a real, really adaptable, flexible bird. Perhaps eats a wider range of food than any other bird of prey in Europe, I would say. And then you've also got the food that people are actually putting out specifically for the kites. So there's a lot of feeding in gardens, particularly down in the, in the Chilterns, uh, where kites are very common. People put food scraps out in the gardens. The kites will come dive down and take advantage. Uh, Reading University have done some really good work to look at this and look at the impacts of this, uh, uh, particularly in the urban centre of Reading and I think the surrounding towns. So that's that can provide a significant amount of food. And then you've got the, the, the specific feeding sites uh, set up for, uh, for specifically for red kites. So this one's just up the road at Bellymac Farm in Galloway, but there's others in Wales. So it can attract hundreds and hundreds of birds uh, and, and you know make sure they're well fed um, every single day of the year. So that, that, can, that can make a difference. Uh, the kite, as I said, it's a very flexible bird. That's not just in terms of the food that it eats, but also nest sites. So again, you probably can't quite see this, but there's those large pine trees are in a garden on the edge of a town uh, in the Chilterns, and there's a kite nest near the top with a with a if you can make it out with a kite sort of sitting on on the nest there. So they're quite happy on the urban fringes, not only feeding but also. Um, the nest sites, are, so, so they're really flexible in terms of, of, of the way they use habitats. Okay, so just for a minute, consider the wider perspective then. So this is the, the, in the global range is restricted within Europe. The yellow is where they're um, migratory and a lot of those birds will move south and southwest for the, for the winter. The red is the, um, the, the resident populations. Now, just a few things to note here, then. Um, so the biggest population is Germany, the estimate there, nine to 14,000 pairs. You note that Britain now is comfortably the second most important population, which is amazing when you think of the, the recent history. And then you've got a few other countries there with, with sizable populations. Again, note the patchy distribution that comes back to this point I'll keep making that if kites are left alone, they can do really, really well and increase and, and spread. But if they are persecuted, they are especially vulnerable to persecution and they can struggle. And you can see in the list of countries there, the trends um, is increasing and doing well in some countries, but there are actually declines in other countries, including quite important populations. So it's not all a, a success story if we think about the wider picture. Uh, again, these these are a bit of a, uh, sort of guesstimated figures, but it gives you a rough idea. The global population is around about uh, thirty thousand pairs, and now Britain perhaps supports as much as a quarter of the total global population. 
So on to some of the threats then. Um, and the big one is illegal persecution, the use of poison baits. So they're, they're not always aimed at kites. They're sometimes put out for foxes or for, uh, for carrion crows perhaps, but the kites are highly efficient scavengers, often first on the scene with predictable results. So, so that's a, a significant problem. They're also quite easy birds to shoot. They spend a lot of time in the air. They've got quite a slow, sort of languid foraging flight, often low over the ground, and they can even be quite curious of people. They'll fly across and come and see if there's a sort of feeding opportunity. Um, so that does make them easy birds to, to shoot. Uh, ignore the, the dates on here. This is another uh, dated slide, but it's a trend that's worth looking at here. And this trend has continued up to the present day. Um, Chilterns and the Black Isle, the first two release projects, the same number of birds released over pretty much the same time period. And in the Chilterns, you've got a rapid increase, perhaps up to 5,000 pairs. That would be the rough, rough guesstimate now. The Black Isle, they breed just as successfully up there. Um, but the population has really, really struggled and it's closer to 100 pairs. The difference is because the Black Isle is close to intensive uh, grouse moors and the levels of persecution are that much higher. So instead of having four to 5,000 pairs, you've got 100 pairs. So it's worth remembering, I think, when you think about the impacts of grouse moors, we think about hen harriers and we think about golden eagles, but actually think how many birds must have been killed over the years. Um, to prevent a population becoming established. Uh, and you do get persecution in the Chilterns, but it's just that much lower levels and the birds are able to, able to cope with it. Some other threats briefly, um, rat, modern rat poisons, highly toxic rat poisons uh, can be an issue. If the kites are, uh, are scavenging on rodents that have been killed by the, the poisons, they can also be killed. Lead shot still unbelievably after all these years, we're still using lead. It goes into the, the things that are shot, and again, the kites being scavengers can ingest a lethal dose. So that, that can be an issue too. Uh, wind farms, uh, probably quite a minor problem, but again, as a highly aerial bird, they spend a lot of time in the air. Uh, and you can see what's happened to this bird. It's been it's like it's sort of made of out of a piece of paper, the way the blades are just sliced, sliced through it. So you're going to lose some birds as a result of uh, an increase in, in wind farms. OK, so yeah, back to the final, uh, back to that original question then, um, that we, the one that we started with, is it our most successful bird? Um, well, I think it once was almost certainly our most common and abundant bird of prey. Uh, I think it could easily become so again because of the flexibility that I've talked about, because it can exploit both urban and rural habitats, uh, because it also takes advantage of handouts provided deliberately for kites. And then if you look at some of the densities you've got in parts of the Chilterns, up to a sort of six pairs per square kilometre, and then you look at all the suitable habitat that there is available for red kites, I think there's a good chance it could become our most common bird of prey uh, in the future. Certainly, you know, 50,000 pairs wouldn't be at all surprising. Uh, and if you look at the, the the most abundant bird of prey at the moment is the buzzard, and the estimates are 65 to 80,000 pairs, I think. I think the cut's got a good chance of, of overtaking that in the future. But obviously, getting to that getting to that stage is going to take time. It's a highly social bird. They like breeding close to others of their own kind, so they can be quite slow to spread into new areas. And of course, we need to tackle these problems uh, with illegal persecution, particularly poisoning, if we want the sort of recovery um, that I think you know we should otherwise expect. OK, just a final thank you again to Dan for the fantastic artwork. Uh, and some of the themes I've, I've touched on today are explored in a bit more detail uh, in, our, in our recent book, The Red Kites Year. So, yeah, check that out if you want a bit more information.
Okay, thank you.